Thank you, I appreciate it. And thanks, thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, I thought I would give you a little bit of sort of personal background uh, for my experience, and then a couple of slides that I used earlier today to set the stage for sort of the, the science and health aspect. So I had a 41 year career at Cornell, just, uh, just retired, became emeritus in January, and moved to a sunnier, uh, longer gardening season place in Cochise County, Arizona. Uh, but during that time, uh, I, I found out you can learn while you're still on campus, because I was trained in genetics, and hired, I'll show you the building in a moment, the, into the poultry department to breed naturally healthier chickens. But I found out very quickly that the funding I could get for research and work really was in environmental health sciences. And over time, I immigrated more to that area, still hopefully using my genetics. So I had a chance, without taking a toxicology course ever, by the way, to direct the Institute for Comparative Environmental Toxicology, uh, was head of the graduate field of immunology at one time, director of the program on breast cancer environmental risk factors, a senior fellow in the uh, Cornell Center for the Environment, which happened to be in the poultry building after the poultry science department closed. So I told people, they're never gonna get me out of this building, I'm just joining whoever's taking it over. You know? And <laughs> president of the immunotoxicology specialty section of the Society of Toxicology, grant panel manager in animal genetics for the USDA, uh, founding editor of a poultry science review journal, um, and uh, air criteria, quality criteria author in immunology for the EPA, uh, Veterans and Agent Orange panel uh, 2010 for National Academies and then book series editor for a couple different publishers. So uh, you, you're there long enough, you get a chance to do a lot, try a lot of different things. And that has really been, uh, it's a fantastic, fantastic place to work. Uh, I do wish it weren't so cold and that's why I'm in Arizona. But um, that's basically the background that has brought me to work on uh, the microbiome eventually and uh, health and particularly in early life. So this was the building I was hired into, uh, the first poultry department in the entire country, named after James Rice, a Cornell professor who founded the Poultry Science Association. So keep in mind with animal husbandry, there really was not a scientific organization that looked at the poultry industry and that had brought science to it. And, and we had some of the discoverers of B vitamins as nutritionists there. And ironically, this department went on to train a lot of people that became, uh, they moved up, they became provost uh, and held administrative positions and uh, eventually we lost them as uh, d department members. But it was a mixed group. We had food science. My, my chair at one point invented uh, chicken McNuggets was one of his claims to fame, and the Cornell, famous Cornell barbecue sauce was his Bob Baker. So I got to interact with food scientists and nutritionists and physiologists and extension people that were developing new products, including we had aquaculture there for a while, fish products for food. And um, that was a wonderful learning experience to be in a multidisciplinary department. But that was my start was with chickens and looking after a healthier life for, for chickens. Um, my wife is really instrumental in a lot of what I did because, you know, she'd come in and say, you know, you should write thus and so. And so here we are pictured where she actually convinced me to write about medicinal plants and the immune system and do a review on that because she has an herbalism training and background and they were holding a plate full of a whole variety of mushrooms and other wonderful plant products. Uh, so that's my only dabbling that connects more with this uh, some aspects of this group, but uh, she got me into, you might say, a lot of trouble or a lot of opportunity through her encouragement. And really it was through that that I, uh, by serendipity, came to work on the microbiome. And I think I explained earlier that it was really waking up, having had a problem and I couldn't solve waking up in the middle of the night from a dream and having an idea that pertained to the microbiome. But it led to uh, a variety of books, uh, Strategies for Protecting Your Child's Immune System was the first one that I did with my wife. I did one where I started with chronic diseases and back engineered toward what you'd measure if you actually wanted to protect a child and the child's immune system, which was kind of novel because people were simply measuring stuff because they could and then hoping it was relevant and usually wasn't in my opinion. So we started with the diseases, went back to what was dysfunctional with the immune system and then what you would actually measure 
to predict whether something was safe or not. Uh, but then on to um, the most recent one on the microbiome, the human superorganism. So the one thing I've done at Cornell, it's amazing. I've taught toxicology, immunology, a lot of details, spe specialized courses in immunology, infectious diseases in the veterinary college as well. But the one that I actually got a teaching award for and was the most fun was a course in overcoming roadblocks or creative problem solving. As, as I tell people, it, it took me about three and a half decades, but I finally figured out how to, um, how to be able to give Cornell students course credit for playing with Legos. And, uh, but for playing differently with Legos. And so this is actually a course to teach scientists how to unfocus because I realized we were teaching them how to focus, focus, focus for their doctoral degrees. And that works until you're stuck. And then guess what? You, we weren't teaching them anything else. So I was teaching them everything else, at least as best I could find, get my hands on and personally experience. So meditation, and eventually I'm winding up teaching this at orientation for incoming foreign students at all levels. And so the first Cornell professor they see teaches them a 30 second meditation to get more information. Um, but that actually was the most fun and, and in a sense teaching things that weren't gonna go out, to, out of date. Because if you can give students the tools to help them navigate and overcome and observe their problems differently, more usefully, then that's something they can carry forward throughout their lifetime. So that was actually the, the more recent teaching that I did that is, uh, in fact, I went back and did it again this past fall in an intensive for Cornell students, but also did it other places in workshops, including Harvard's, that's Harvard School of Public Health with their building blocks. We're not just about science. My wife's a novelist and, and really a jack of all trades. And I had an interest in Scottish silver and goldsmithing and so we wrote actually about five books in the end on Scottish history, decorative arts, um, the evolution of the novel styles. We wrote a compendium with 6,000 pieces of old Scottish silver logged, and also some articles in magazines and some uh, in the Silver Society journals. So that's sort of my, you can actually use the Cornell Library for things that are not science as well, I found out. And that's how I spent my spare time, I guess you'd say. Um, Okay, this way, yes. And the thing that keeps me going and where I get my creative ideas is my main hobby, which is swing dancing, which is great because you integrate with your music, you integrate with a partner, you move your body, and I sleep better after I, after I swing dance. So that is actually, I wanna tell you that besides the fact that this is one of the most creative conferences I've ever been to, I've learned so much from you guys that this is the first conference in my whole career, started presenting back in the 70s, where I was able to present at the conference and dance at the conference, because I danced last night, and thank you, <laughs> it was a dance. So I used to have to sneak away from the conference to do it. My record was a toxicology meeting in Salt Lake City, where I was there 36 hours, and I gave my talk, and I went to three dances. I thought that was pretty good. But uh, this one, the conference had a dance. Thank you so much. So that's my, uh, that's what I do. And by the way, Cornell had uh, Tucson, close to me now, has the oldest West Coast Swing Dance Club in the US, yay. Um, but Ithaca has it, had its own clubs with Cornell. And here's Bill Nye, the science guy. And he is a Lindy dancer, he's an uh, East Coast Swing Dancer. And he was at our club one night and uh, when he was visiting back to Cornell. I think he was on Dancing with the Stars till he injured himself. But, um, uh, anyway, so that's, uh, that's, again, spare time. The two slides for content to, to, uh, as the final part of the introduction, and you may have seen these earlier, but I just want to make the point that one of the reasons that I'm <clears throat> excited, love to talk about the microbiome, the immune system, and health, whether it's uh, animals, human health, or otherwise, is the fact that we're mainly microbes by a couple different measures, so that <clears throat> As I indicated earlier today, if human chromosomal gene content is 22 to 25,000 approximately, then the microbial genes that are carried among humans is just under 10 million across human population. And within each individual is about 3.3 million. So that adds up to more than 99% of our genes are from the microbes, from bacteria, archaea, um, <clears throat> 
uh, viruses and fungi. So mainly microbial with genes that are metabolizing and signaling and doing everything that the chromosomal genes do but from the microbes means that when you do medicine, for example, it really ought to be, as I told pediatricians last month, microbiome first medicine because guess what? That's the target. They see the environment first. They're on the actual outside of our gut. If you think about it, your GI tract is exposed to the external world, communicating to us internally. So food, chemicals, drugs, unless they're IV injected, are passing through the microbiome, through the microbes before they hit our microbial cells, whether it's lung cells or uh, airway cells or gut lining or otherwise or below the skin. And what they do with it determines what we see, if it's nutritional, if it's useful, if it's dangerous. And as a result, we better know what they're doing. But the good news is these are malleable. We can control the 3.3 million genes. And we're learning more and more about exactly how to do that and what you might want to change. So that's why, to me, this is really, managing microbes is gonna be the future. You guys start with the soil, which is the right place to start. Go through the plants and the food production animals. And in the end, anything we do with humans is dependent upon the foundations that you're laying already in your practices. If you go to cells, it's a slight majority, about 57%. And so finally, I made the, the point earlier today in the last slide that these are located at the portals of entry. And these are where infectious agents get in. So whether we get infected is to a large extent determined by the status of our microbiome in the airways, on the skin, in the gut, in your genital tract. And that's good reason to have a good frontline defense. But these are also our gatekeeper and our filter. So exposure to, to environmental toxicants or to drugs, again, is gonna be determined by the makeup of the microbes, extent to which it's rich or sparse. And for example, if you had exposure to arsenic in drinking water, you have an individual risk that differs from someone else depending on a couple different species of gut bacteria and how they metabolize arsenic. There's some that metabolize it in a very protective way, others that produce very dangerous metabolites. And we've not been taking that into account. And so there'll be personalized medicine, there'll be personalized risk so that you can be better protected against the things you're most vulnerable to. So that's really the introduction to the microbiome. It's why I'm so excited. And it was really a navigation over 41 years of working on the developing immune system, first in chicks and then in children, trying to protect it better from environmental insult and realizing that until you include the microbiome, you don't have enough of the story. So now we've got some of the pieces together that are gonna help. So that's my introduction and thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hi everyone, I am Allison Sosna. I am a chef and the director of nutrition for World Central Kitchen. Um, tonight I'll be talking about the intersection between nutrition, agriculture, public health, chefing, and all those good things. Um, so just a little background on World Central Kitchen. Does anyone, raise your hand if you know what, who Chef Jose Andres is or World Central Kitchen. Okay, great. So for those of you who don't know, World Central Kitchen was founded by uh, celebrity chef Jose Andres. The impetus for that was one day when the earthquake happened in Haiti. He felt compelled to go and look at the, at, look at what happened. And he discovered and said, you know, there's some, I want to give back. I need to do something. Um, and so with that, he created World Central Kitchen in 2010 and started a culinary school among other programs under World Central Kitchen. Um, so I'm going to talk, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about myself. I don't, line dance or swing dance. I have a great corgi, a great girlfriend. I love my job. Uh, I need to get a hobby, I guess. Um, <laughs> that was a hard act to follow, swing dancing. Um, so a little bit about me uh, is when I was in college, I studied abroad in Italy, um, and it really completely changed my life. I connected with people via food um, and said, okay, I want to do something 
with my life that involves food and people and community. I didn't come back being like, oh, I want to be a chef. I just came back saying, okay, I like those factors and the easiest way for me to hone in on those factors is to volunteer at a restaurant. So I went down the street, I volunteered at a restaurant. One thing led to another. I went to culinary school. I did fine dining. Knew that fine dining was not going to be my future. Um, but then inevitably ended up working at a nonprofit called DC Central Kitchen, which teaches formerly incarcerated men and women culinary job training, and then gets them jobs. So from there, I unintentionally got into school food. One thing led to another, and then I started a nonprofit teaching kids how to cook on a SNAP budget or a food stamp budget for $3.50 per meal per family of four. And so the only way to do that is to buy in bulk and to buy something, those things, healthy products like spices, brown rice in bulk. Um, so from there, I did some consulting and yada, yada, yada. Went to grad school for nutrition, came back, and it, through happenstance and the fluidity of my career, <laughs> ended up as the nutrition director of World Central Kitchen. And it mirrors both my culinary skills and my nutrition skills. So that being said, um, World Central Kitchen Nutrition, the title slide. What do I have to do? Okay, great. So as part of my position, I focus on emergency feeding and long-term projects. So long-term projects include, we have a culinary school in Haiti called L'Ecole des Chefs. There we train culinary students for jobs. We also have a uh, program called Sink to Stove, which educates men and women in developing countries on moving away from uh, um, cooking with coal to gas, and also sanitation, improving sanitation. Um, so with <clears throat> Sink to Stove and with the Culinary School in Haiti, we worked on developing a program incorporating um, basics, like what is a calorie, what is protein, and you know, I've, I've also gotten to um, translate my skills and across curriculum to French, Spanish, Creole. I'm not fluent in all of those, but that's been fun. Um, come on. What am I now? There we go. Um, and now more of what we're doing, more of what my job entails is emergency nutrition feeding. So that is a picture of us in the... I'll go back. That's a picture of us um, loading food and sandwiches into a helicopter or uh, to get to one of the islands that was impacted by Hurricane Dorian. So Hurricane Dorian was made landfall in the beginning of September. Um, we were actually deployed a day or two before the hurricane struck. Um, and we were deployed that early because when you're in a hurricane, the airport's shut down and you're not able to go and, cre and make food for people. So we ended up going in, we were in Nassau, and we don't really go in with a plan. <laughs> We go in and say, okay, well, we're here. Let's find the food. Let's not t ship it in for the most part. Let's find the food. We'll find the volunteers, and we'll figure out a way to get food to the people. So one of the ways that we got food to the people was through, were through chartering helicopters. Um, and not, granted, not everyone can do this, but the only way to get to one of the islands, Abaco, that was greatly impacted where Hurricane Dorian idled for 72 hours was to by ship or by helicopter. Um, so one of the challenges initially was, okay, let's find as much food as possible. Awesome. Let's make as much food as possible. Good. Okay, let's put it all in the helicopter. The helicopter only holds 100 pounds. <sighs> okay, all right, well, we'll send that somewhere else. Okay, we got a helicopter, we got a pilot, right? Nope. Can't take off without a co-pilot. 
there were so many learning curves with going into Hurricane Dorian with the Bahamas where we hadn't experienced in the past. So in the past, we had gone to her, we had gone to disasters for the wildfires in California. We made food during Hurricane Michael. We had been to Guatemala. We had covered a lot of disasters, but this, we'd been to Mozambique during the cyclone. And this was the first disaster that was very, very challenging in terms of acquiring transportation, finding the food. A lot of the food in the Bahamas came from on barges from Florida. So if we weren't able to get orders in a week or so ahead of time, then we wouldn't have enough food to make people. So it, there was a very, very steep learning curve for this particular mission. Um, okay, so the other two things that I'm going to talk about is when we are, in terms of innovation, as the nutrition and chef person on staff, I have the luxury of going in as a chef, but then also seeing where we have gaps in efficiencies. So there was one circumstance where we were deployed getting ready for Hurricane Barry in Louisiana. And we had a food distributor that came and instead of providing the gallons of mayo and the gallons of ketchup that we ordered, we were sent packets of, packets of mayo, the individual packets, individual croutons, individual ketchup. In an emergency, that's not a great product to have. So... What ended up happening was we said, okay, and our sandwich bread came in frozen. So on that volume, it would have taken a very long time to defrost the bread when usually the sandwiches are the first things we start making. So that being said, when that happens, we usually have a chef or a volunteer or someone like myself go to the closest grocery store, large retailer, Target, et cetera, and kind of hope that there's bread, that there's ketchup, that there's mayo that we can get and that hasn't sold out. So luckily we were able to acquire those things, but it just made me think, okay, well, what if, what if it wasn't me as the nutritionist that went to the store and knew how to read the labels quickly? So I'm currently with a data, uh, data, data society. Um, they are helping me develop an app that will populate the first 20 or so products that are the healthiest. So if I go and I say, oh my God, I need mayo, you click on mayo and then it'll be a drop down of like the 20 top healthiest mayos. As healthy as mayo can get, right? Um, so that's exciting, but it's a tool that not necessarily we want to have to use, but it's a tool that nonetheless we created because we saw that gap. And as a organization that works on efficiencies, it's always good to have those tools. The other thing that we are currently working on is our meals are pretty good in terms of iron content. Um, the chefs work on increasing vitamins and minerals based on what they can acquire, which de differs between every mission we are on. However, for example, when we're making about rice for, say, 20,000 meals, like we were doing in the Bahamas and Mozambique, it takes about 750 gallons of water to make that rice. There's a company called Lucky Iron Fish. Does anyone know who Lucky Iron Fish is? Okay, cool. Lucky Iron Fish is a company that created a fish that when you put in simmering water, boiling water, iron will come out into the water. So I was working with the team and said, oh my God, that's great, I love the product, but that's for like one to five liters of water. Can we figure out how to make a really big fish? So we're currently working on a really big fish, but in the meantime, um, these little fish can, are going to be used in the future for using, um, to work with folks in week three or week four after we've gotten over the immediate disaster to do nutrition education. So when, we're, when we deploy and we leave the zone, the, the mission, 
were able to have taught some kind of a nutrition skill and cooking skill because this is not a one-time thing. You don't just use the fish and then the, you know, the fish swims away. Sorry, I had to. Um, and so that preventative care is very important to me. We are not a nonprofit that goes in and feeds people and then leaves. And, um, preventative care in my book is, is really important for, for me and, then the, and the whole team. What just happened? Yikes. Help. Okay, great. Um, okay, so this is a slide of the meal that we made in Mozambique for the cyclone. So Mozambique was unique in we had to drive hours southbound to acquire the food because there was nothing after the devastation. Thousands of hectares of land were annihilated and we had to take a truck to go down about three hours south and to acquire as many goods and produce as possible. We drove that back and put it in huge pots. And basically the 20,000 meals or so we made every day were out of big jacket kettles. So think lots and lots of stew. So we made rice and then we made a chicken, we made, had chicken and string beans, onions, potatoes, etc. in this stew. And so when you run the numbers on my end, we were able to say, oh my God, this meal has 31% of the daily recommended iron. Like not everyone is getting really excited about this, but like, you know, we talk about it. And then 72% of their daily folate. Like, yeah, we put it on social media, but like I was really excited about it. But those making edits with the chefs and in adding more rice and adding more string beans really makes a difference in those eight ounces that we give per person. So we pay for all the food. So when we calculate price and portions, eight ounces of food, depending on what those ingredients are, are very important. So my goal is to optimize the nutritional value of those eight ounces. So this is a snapshot, a couple months old, and we're improving on the meals, of some of the meals we've done in the past, um, running the numbers on them, their calories, et cetera, and then seeing, okay, how can we improve on those meals? So a lot of chefs are inclined to be like, Vegetables are great. I love vegetables. I'm going to put a ton of vegetables in this meal. Allie, I got tons of vegetables. It's awesome. Cool. However, a lot of those vegetables are just not providing enough calories. So we have to pivot in the chefs that really mean well. And, and I'm all about vegetables. But we have to pivot in the way that we think and say, well, the majority of the daily intake, we have to have a lot of carbs. And we don't want to have non-starchy, we don't want to have starchy carbs. We don't have a lot of, we don't want to have a lot of peas. We don't have a lot, want to have a lot of potato. Um, so this is a breakdown of where we were. And so this was months and months ago. So this is a snapshot of vitamins and protein, et cetera. Um, Jose and our team is very adamant about having a lot of chicken, which is, is great. So we do a lot of chicken in our meals, but you can see that depending on what we put in the meal drastically differs from mission to mission. So this is one example of just making one small change and quantifying that Per, per day, right? So when we were in Colombia, the chef could get apples and oranges, and we just said, well, let's shift away from oranges to apples. And by shifting that, we provided 380,000 more calories per day. And so when you have folks that have been walking all day long that are just trying to make their lives better and they have no nourishment and you provide them with that apple versus the orange, that's a lot of extra calories, especially when we're working and providing food for children. And then this is a, 
this is a quote from one of the mothers in Colombia. And, you know, it's easy to go in day, out, day in and day out and do your job. And when you're chefing, it's, it's just a lot of go, 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 make food, make food, make food. But when you come back and say, there's a parent that says, you know, some of these kids have never had an apple before or it's just too expensive. That's powerful. Um, okay, so yeah, so this is just summarizing again a couple pictures on Hurricane Dorian. Again, on the left, we have, we're loading food into an airplane. The second picture is a picture of the enriched pasta we were able to get. And so one of the challenges that we have when we're chefing is we don't have control over everything we want to buy, but we can try really hard to get products that are more nutritious. And the only way to do that is to demand that they get that, right? So if the provider says, oh, okay, yeah, we do have enriched pasta, but it, it takes us trying to get that product, which isn't always easy. So that was, I was really happy about that. It was my first time ordering. We were in the Bahamas. I was really excited about it. And then the last picture on the right is of us making kind of like a beef vegetable stew out of paella pans. With We were in Freeport, Abaco, and Nassau for the Bahamas. And that's a picture of us in Freeport. And that is where we were putting out 23,000 meals a day. And Jose, our founder and chef, is really adamant about using paella pans. And if you don't have a kitchen to immediately go in and start cooking, propane in a paella pan is kind of like our special sauce. So we have really big paella pans, like I'm not even kidding, like the size of this table. And we've got like eight or ten of them. And you can get about 23,000 meals in, to in total. So that's a picture of our paella pan, one of the chefs. Okay, yeah, and this is just quickly the most recent fires, um, a picture of some of the chefs that came and helped us out, and then a picture of local farmers in California that were providing food for us to cook, but then also donating it to people that were impacted. And then lastly, this is a project that I started before my time at World Central Kitchen, like I just said. This was the microgreens project, teaching kids and uh, how to cook on a budget of $3.50 per family of four. And so these are just some pictures. So the first, the first of the, the eight classes, the first class they learn how to cut mirepoix, which is carrots, onions, and celery. So that's a picture of one of our students cutting their, doing their brinois. The second picture is our focus and encouragement on buying frozen vegetables because usually you can get a deal on them and you can store them. And as, as long as you know how to cook them, you can, get very, you can get the nutritional value from those frozen vegetables. And then the last, <laughs> the last picture is my favorite. That is week two of the class and they are butchering chicken. Not every one of our kids eats chicken, but for the most part, it's really, really fun because they're hands-on, they're given a knife, they cut along the breast line, they pop out the thigh, and then they know how to stretch one chicken for three weeks. So that's one of my favorite pictures. And, and that's it. So yeah, so basically disaster feeding has been the most recent year. Um, and with, with farming and purchasing of ingredients and disasters, we first and foremost purchase local, and then we work outbound, which, is, um, which has been challenging, but also really helpful to support the local economy. So thank you. Not, that's not auspicious. I'm gonna use this. <clears throat> okay. All right, so I'm not going to talk about myself at all <clears throat> um, for your benefit because that would be terrible. Um, but 
Thank you guys for being here and staying, sticking around. I know it's late after a long day, so I hope that you can hang with. This is a, these are, hot, this is hot off the presses for me. Um, it's ideas I've been working on for a couple years, but I've never really shared them much. So this is pretty speculative and um, maybe wild, but anyway, we'll see how it goes. So, um, a common refrain nowadays is that we must work with nature. No one here needs to be told that agriculture often gets a bad rap on this score, but not all of the negative press is without merit. What also probably goes without saying is that farmers, ranchers, and shepherds are the original workers with nature. And yet, let's see if it works. Yeah, she told me the things over there. See, we're out of balance. Things are out of balance. Why? Um, some of the reasons are political, economic, and technological, but those aren't primary. I contend that the primary reason we are out of balance has to do with worldview. Literally, the way we see the world and our place in it. Yeah. So, what is the common, what is the current dominant perspective? Okay. People generally conceive of the world in Newtonian terms, as a collection of discrete things plants, animals, buildings, rocks, people, machines, etc. This is a way of, or like pieces on a chessboard. This is a way of thinking that philosophers call dualism. In this framework, there are subjects and objects, us and them, self and other, each one distinct and mutually exclusive from the other. Because of this worldview, we have, at first without realizing it, severely disrupted the world around us. This in turn has created a storm of health problems for animals, plants, and people. We are now beset with chronic illnesses. Of the top 10 causes of death in the US today, microbes play a significant, sometimes primary role in nine of them. And the nutritional value of food has declined dramatically. So what gives? Why is this happening? This is a clip from a film I made that might start to shed some light on what I think is happening. We have a very skewed sense of our relationship with microorganisms in general and bacteria specifically. And collectively outweigh the animals by a hundred million times. doing this for a thousand times longer than our species has existed. We've just touched the corner of understanding the diversity of the microbes that are out there. We've barely scratched the surface. And we need to understand this because again, they make plants functional. They affect the movement of methane and hydrogen and nitrogen and phosphorus. They affect the carbon fixation and the plankton in the oceans. Viewing them as important players in our ecosystem in the same way people have viewed forests and grasslands would probably make us treat the world in a better way. So, it's the microbes, or more properly, the microbiome, and the ways we have in attempting to control it wreaked havoc on it and ourselves. And again, at the root of our recklessness is a persistent wrong, I think, is a persistent wrong-headed view of nature and our place in it. 
a view that does not recognize the deep interconnectedness and ecology of life. So how did we arrive at this dualistic worldview? I mean, it's complicated. It has roots in theological notions of human dominion over creation, along with Greek and Renaissance notions about our primacy among species on earth. Such ideas about mankind then collided and conjoined with Darwin's theory of evolution and were used to reinforce a zero-sum worldview in which man, particularly certain types of men, must be the pinnacle of natural selection in the final phase of evolution to the exclusion of other concerns. Then later, after the germ theory was developed in the 19th century and then antibiotics were developed to kill them in the 20th century, misguided ideas about purity, cleanliness, and health threw us further out of joint and on a crash course with our current chronically ill world. It's another clip. Look at that smudge. Look at those germs she leaves on the doorknob. And here's Bob's hand picking them up. Yes, even during an ordinary conversation, saliva and mucus particles escape our mouth and easily reach others who inhale them as they breathe. How then, with so many germs surrounding us, can we avoid having colds all the time? Well, fortunately, our body has defenses against this enemy. We have about tenfold more bacteria in and on our bodies than we have human cells in our bodies. We are basically walking microbial planets. We actually need them biologically. We wouldn't be able to survive if we didn't have some of these bacteria inside of us. The challenge is that if we want to kill pathogens, harmful bacteria, it's very difficult to do that without causing injury to the normal bacteria that live inside us. And when we accidentally kill off friendly bacteria in our guts or on our skin, it sets us up for being super infected by an organism that normally would not be able to infect us because it would get outcompeted by the friendly bacteria that live in and on us. And so now we find ourselves at a crossroads. Confronted by hard realities about industrialization and the health of the planet, and chief among these hard realities is the fact that the soil, like the atmosphere, is a shockingly thin membrane that sustains life on Earth. The atmosphere that protects Earth from the icy vastness of space is essentially a layer of invisible gas only 60 miles thick. The average depth of topsoil, on the other hand, is three feet. And yet, it take, it, and yet, this three feet, on average, makes terrestrial life on Earth possible. It's the threshold between life and death, decay and renewal. And microbes are the agents that make all of that life happen. Whether it's in the soil, a cow's rumen, the root system of a legume, or our guts, every surface in the world and us is covered and constituted by microbes. The reality, as you all know better than most, is that our health and the health of all other life on Earth is connected via this microbial matrix. And as the soil goes, so go we. So what's at stake if we don't change the way we think about the microbial world and our place in it? Food security, travel, 401ks, on-demand everything, all the things most people take for granted now become irrevocably disrupted if we continue on this path. This is why the regenerative perspective is so critical. Unlike the still dominant mid 19th century worldview that reduces health and fertility to chemistry, regenerative ag takes a quantum view 
and proceeds from the assumption that this is, this is me, right? You guys are the regenerative <laughs> ag people, but this is my, my perspective of it. The regenerative ag, regenerative ag takes a quantum view and proceeds from the assumption that animal, including human, plant, and soil health are all products of the same complex ecology. And a huge upshot of this perspective that I'd like to leave you with is, is that this view is also fundamentally cooperative. Unlike the Newtonian, everything is pool balls crashing about, 19th century, all life is competition and fertility equals chemistry view, the regenerative view recognizes and fosters symbiosis. There's still tension, stress, inflammation, etc., and that is all good. It's part of what keeps us sharp and healthy. But it's the attention to symbiosis and cooperation that's key. For instance, and apropos of this session, did you know that of the million or so different types of microbes that live in and on us, only about 1,400 are potentially pathogenic? That's something. That's 700 helpers, or at least neutrals, commensals, for every one potential bad guy. And what's more, that impulse toward cooperation, the one that suffuses this whole conference, and the practice of regenerative agri agriculture more generally, has been at the center of life on Earth from its outset. Multicellular, eukaryotic life on Earth is first and foremost, this is a pretty new way of thinking, but I think it's true. Rodney can tell me if I'm way out of my depth here, but multicellular, eukaryotic life on Earth is first and foremost the outcome of combination and symbiosis, cooperation among single-celled prokaryotic microbes, not, as was earlier thought, division and competition. And the evidence there is the the structure of mitochondria inside of cells, uh, among other things. So, we have a lot to learn from microbes. Of course, microbes don't think, they just do. But, they do so in a way that is much more finely attuned to the flows and nuances of nature and their neighbors, of hormesis and homeostasis, of disruption and balance, all of the things that create resilience and vitality. And in this way, the regenerative microbial worldview provides a means for optimizing our own success, as well as the success of our plants and animals, and also of our colleagues and neighbors. It's inspiring to see that spirit in action at this conference and on the regenerative farms and ranches I've visited and worked on. You can almost feel the rightness of it. And I believe that that rightness proceeds from a worldview whose rightness is right, not for moral reasons, that'd be a separate conversation, but because it resonates and conforms with the basic conditions that give rise to and maintain life. And if that's not a persuasive rationale for adopting something, I don't know what is.